A series of violent protests is disturbing the stability in India administrative Jammu and Kashmir. What started out as the death of one militant commander has since then escalated into a violent standoff between Indian security forces and local residents. As of this writing, more than 60 people have been killed and over 7,000 civilians and 4,000 security personnel have been injured. In some places, the crisis has compelled the local authorities to impose a curfew and in other areas, telecommunications have been cut off and many schools and colleges and businesses have been closed. In this report, we will go over the historic context of the Kashmir conflict as well as address the underlying motives of the current crisis. My name is Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. Kashmir is a fiercely contested territory between India, Pakistan and to a smaller degree China. The region has a complicated history but the current conflict dates back to the partition of the Indian subcontinent in 1947. As the British withdrew, the subcontinent was split into India and Pakistan. The division was based on religious demographics. An estimated 14 million people were displaced during the partition. It was the largest mass migration in human history. Muslim majority states formed Pakistan and Hindu majority states formed India. In Jammu and Kashmir, however, the situation was more complicated. The region had a Muslim majority population, but it was reigned by Hari Singh, a Hindu nobleman. Initially, Singh was reluctant to pick sides, but as circumstances escalated, he decided to join India. Interestingly enough, in Junaga and Hyderabad, reverse situations existed. The Hindu majority populations were ruled by Muslim noblemen. The rulers of Junaga and Hyderabad explored their options to join Pakistan, but the local Hindu populations revolted. The Indian army stepped in, installed new governors, and annexed both territories. For Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, the turn of events was unacceptable. Jinnah argued that the division of India and Pakistan was based on the idea that Muslims and Hindus were distinct groups and required separate states. Furthermore, Jinnah pointed out that if Hindu majority Junaga and Hyderabad belonged to India, then Muslim majority Kashmir belonged to Pakistan. As tensions between Muslims and Hindus escalated, a devastating war erupted. Roughly a year and thousands of lives later, the first Kashmir war ended in a stalemate. Pakistan had taken nearly a third of the territory in Kashmir, whereas India controlled the rest. Over the next few decades, more wars would be waged, but eventually a UN-backed ceasefire was reached. Kashmir was divided along the line of control between Pakistan and India. New Delhi further divided the region in three subdivisions, Jammu, Kashmir and Ladakh. Kashmir or Kashmir Valley covers only 16% of the territory, but it has the largest population. Of the 6.8 million people, at least 96% are Muslims. Neighboring Jammu covers 26% of the territory. Here, the population stands at 5.4 million, of which 63% are Hindus and 33% are Muslims. Finally, Ladakh, the largest division, covers 58% of the territory, but it only has a population of about 270,000 people. In Ladakh, Muslims and Buddhists respectively amount to about 46% and 40% of the population. Overall, of the total 12.5 million people, 68% are Muslims and 28% are Hindus. However, most of the unrest has been limited to Kashmir Valley. Starting in the 1980s, local independence parties were set up in Kashmir Valley. Pakistan exploited this situation and by the end of the decade, militant groups were created. The level of violence peaked in the 1990s as the Pakistan-backed insurgency rebelled against Indian rule. Thousands of lives were lost. In 2001 alone, over 4,500 people had died in the uprising. Moreover, most of Kashmir Valley's Hindu population had fled the region due to the violence. New Delhi responded with a massive crackdown and deployed roughly 600,000 soldiers in the India administrative Jammu and Kashmir. Eventually, violence declined by the early 2000s. 
India and Pakistan reaffirmed commitments to a peaceful resolution in the Lahore Declaration of 1999. However, shortly following the September 11 attacks in New York, the prospects of peace in Kashmir dwindled. Moreover, Kashmiri independence was discredited over the global unease of violent Islamist movements. This gave New Delhi the opportunity to deal with Kashmir with unprecedented latitude. Essentially, India turned the region into a giant military bunker. Over the years, the militarization of Kashmir and the immunity that Indian security forces enjoy have led to grave human rights violations. As a result, the national government gradually lost whatever support it had in Kashmir. At the same time, public support for the insurgency increased. As tensions increased, in 2010 a new revolt engulfed the region. Indian security forces responded harshly and cracked down on the unarmed protesters. In the subsequent years, the 2010 crackdown inspired the Kashmiri insurgency to evolve. Many young and educated men, some in their teenage years, left their jobs and colleges to take up arms for what they believe is their right to self-determination. What sets the younger generation of rebels apart was their endorsement of new technologies. For example, access to social media in Kashmir increased from 25% in 2010 to 75% in 2015. With this in mind, separatist groups started using Facebook and WhatsApp to recruit new fighters. Their reach through social media is immense. Imagine Che Guevara recruiting people through Facebook. Whether one agrees or not, it does make an impact. Since public support for insurgency had increased, Indian security forces responded by detaining local political leaders and activists on false pretenses under the Public Safety Act. Yet, these human rights violations have only further alienated the local population. And this brings us to the current unrest in Kashmir. In early July 2016, the 22-year-old separatist commander Burhan Wani was killed in an encounter with Indian security forces. Wani was part of the Hezbollah Mujahideen, one of the largest secessionist groups in the region. The organization was founded in the 1990s during the peak of the Pakistan-backed insurgency. However, India, the United States and the European Union have designated the Hezbollah group as a terrorist organization. Still, for the locals, the Hezbollah Mujahideen and their charismatic fighters such as Wani are heroic outlaws, comparable to Robin Hood. After the news of Wani's death, protests erupted in Kashmir Valley. In some areas, violent clashes broke out. By the end of the first day of the protests, 20 police stations had been attacked and more than 200 people had been injured. By the end of the second day, more than 20 people were confirmed dead. Clashes between authorities and protesters continued on and off in August. The last major encounter in early September left more than 50 people injured. Yet, Wani's death was only a trigger point. The roots of the current unrest in Kashmir has to do with the deteriorating state of affairs. First, many locals are upset with the human rights abuses. Under Section 144 of the Criminal Procedure Act, assemblies of people are banned, and anyone who speaks up is detained under the Public Safety Act. This allows for Indian soldiers to act with impunity in the region, which is enforced either way through the Armed Forces Special Power Act. The leadership in New Delhi maintains that these rules have brought peace to the region. That may appear to be true, but New Delhi's public support in Kashmir has sharply declined. Second, unemployment in Kashmir is a major factor contributing to the radicalization of the region. Currently, unemployment stands at 5%, which is higher than the neighboring states. In fact, the region's chief minister, Mehbuba Mufti, named youth unemployment as one of Kashmir's leading problems. With so many unemployed young people who are frustrated anyways due to the militarized region, it becomes easier to embrace violence. Third, Prime Minister Narendra Modi's party and his rhetoric sits ill with the residents of Kashmir. 
For instance, the Indian People's Party has proposed to construct housing colonies in Kashmir for families of Indian soldiers. The party is also seeking to repeal Article 370 of the Indian Constitution, which grants special autonomous status to the state of Jammu and Kashmir. The erosion of autonomy, as well as Modi's rhetoric, has only alienated the residents of Kashmir from the rest of India. The leadership of India is fully aware of the roots of the radicalization in Kashmir, yet Prime Minister Modi is incapable of actually addressing the grievances. Instead, he has chosen to blame Pakistan for the crisis. Islamabad certainly has played a crucial role in promoting insurgency in the 1990s. In truth, however, the current crisis is indigenous to India. It's also important to point out that Modi's legitimacy and approval rates derive from his Hindu nationalist policy. Such a policy could strengthen India in the long term. However, in Kashmir, Modi's Hindu nationalist approach undermines his ability to compromise with the local Muslim majority population. Essentially, Modi cannot make serious concessions with the local Muslim needs without looking weak. For the Prime Minister, maintaining legitimacy is more important than resolving the socio-economic problems in Kashmir. Thus, by pointing the finger at Pakistan, Modi strengthens his support base but it also leaves the situation in Kashmir unresolved. To be fair, the same principle also applies to Pakistan. Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif's Muslim League party won over 32% of the votes. Sharif's hard stance against India may have won him the elections, but it also renders him incapable of approaching India. In a way, the regressing situation in Kashmir is the product of the rhetoric in New Delhi and Islamabad. As poor as the relations are between India and Pakistan, they could actually take a turn for the worse. In a recent public statement, Modi mentioned his support to the separatist movements in Pakistan's Balochistan region. In truth, however, Modi's statement is meant for PR purposes rather than a genuine threat. First, Pakistani intelligence has a firm grip on the situation in Balochistan. Second, supporting Balochi separatism would also affect Tehran as Iran too has a large ethnic Balochi population. Third, Khwadar port located in the Pakistani province of Balochistan, plays a crucial role in the $46 billion China-Pakistan Economic Corridor project, meaning Indian intervention in Balochistan would be perceived as a threat to Chinese and Iranian interests. The last thing India needs is to upset Iran and China at the same time. For these reasons, Modi's Balochistan threat is really meant for PR purposes. From a legal perspective, Kashmir is part of India. From an ideological point of view, the region belongs to Pakistan. Most people are split along these two lines. However, one factor that is often overlooked is the geopolitics of Kashmir. In truth, for both countries, the strategic stakes are high. For instance, Pakistan's longest river, the Indus, runs right through the country. The river connects and holds the nation together. However, the Indus, along with other major rivers such as the Jhelum and Janab, flow through Kashmir. For Pakistan, like most downstream countries, any major power that controls the upstream riparian is a security threat. Pakistan and India do have a water control treaty, which guarantees that Islamabad receives water from the Indus, Jhelum, and Janab rivers. But as we have pointed out before, geopolitics is based on capabilities, not on intentions. Essentially, if India controls the upstream riparian, Pakistan in the long term would be subjugated. For this reason, Pakistan must push to fully control Kashmir. Furthermore, the more territory Islamabad can control in Kashmir, the greater Pakistan can expand its alliance with China. The opposite is true for India. The more territory New Delhi can control in Kashmir, the more it can restrain China's influence in Pakistan. 
For India, there are different, but equally crucial, security interests at stake. What's important to understand here is that India is a unique confederation. There are many distinct ethnic groups spread over equally distinct states. All these states compete for influence and power. Sometimes the competition comes at the expense of other states. Prime Minister Modi is seeking to centralize power and reform the economy, but the traditional fear is that with the loss of Kashmir, a wave of separatism would devastate India. In essence, Kashmir isn't just about the territory and the local people, whoever fully controls it will be able to approach regional issues from a position of strength. Considering the political rhetoric and the geopolitical necessities, there is no feasible solution for the region. We could say that the national government in New Delhi needs to review the enacted laws in the region and uphold justice by disciplining soldiers who violate human rights. We could also mention that Modi needs to gradually demilitarize the region and give the locals a voice in the negotiations with Pakistan. However, Taking into account Modi's Hindu nationalist rhetoric and the geopolitical stakes, nothing will change anytime soon. Instead, the most likely outcome of the current crisis is that India will continue to rely on force to exert its authority in Kashmir. At the same time, Modi will ignore calls to address the roots of the crisis. As a result, separatist tendencies in Kashmir will only increase over time. This was a Caspian report by me, Shirvan. I just want to extend special thanks to the following top contributors on Patreon. Their support and that of many others have made this report possible. And if you want to help with the costs of the show, please visit our Patreon page for more information. For now, thank you for watching, take care and Sahol.